Halo, selamat pagi. Oh, selamat pagi, Prof. Good morning. Terima kasih, Prof. Sudah join, Prof. Ya, terima kasih. Uh, Prof, suara saya cukup terdengar ya, Prof? Ya. Jelas ya. Bagaimana suara saya terdengar? Jelas, Prof. Terima kasih. Ya. Uh, mungkin kita mau ini tes untuk ini apa? Share screen. Ya, tes untuk share the screen ya. terlihat jelas jelas bisa ya bisa kelihatan oke okay. thank you bro ya coba suaranya bisa lebih uh, makin uh, saya tes dulu ya, ya. Uh, selamat pagi presiden suara saya terdengar prof bisa ya. suara saya jelas uh, ada, uh, coba keras sedikit saya coba saya besarkan lagi I think saya punya udah maksimum oh, oke okay. tolong audio yang di belakang dibesarkan lagi untuk coba MC coba dari mic yang sebelah saya ya Prof good evening Prof Nggak ada, mungkin. Halo? Dari, dari mic yang lain apa terdengar, Prof? Halo, selamat malam, Prof. Good evening to you. Iya, yeah, kayaknya ada koneksi. Ada ke masalah. Ah, oke. Okay. Oke. Okay. Ya, yeah, sorry. Terputus tadi. Oke, okay, thank you. Uh, saya coba dari... Nah, udah, udah bagus sekarang. Oh, Oke, okay. thank you, bro. Ya, yeah, much better. Tes satu. Satu, dua, ini makin aja nih. Yang mic-mic ini. Cik. Tes satu, satu. Ya, oke, okay, oke. Okay. Oke, okay, sip. Tes satu. kelihatan uh, sharing screen-nya kelihatan ya? Kelihatan, Bro. Jelas. Ya. Oke. Okay. Koneksinya juga bagus, Bro. Oke. Okay. Ini yang uh, yang datang ini mahasiswa kedokteran semua dari bedah plastik sama bedah umum. Uh, ya, mahasiswa kedokteran S1, uh -huh. Prof, sama uh -huh. prodi bedah umum di uh -huh. UI, terus sama kami mengundang prodi bedah plastik dari UI, dari UNPAD, dari semua prodi bedah plastik dari kota lain juga kami undang, Prof. Wah, banyak juga jadinya, ya? Iya, yeah, Prof. Hmm. Karena ini kesempatan yang bagus, Prof. Iya. Yeah. <laughs> mengundang Prof sebagai... Yeah. Pembicara. Ya, terima kasih. Ya, ini uh, sebenarnya ini kalau masuk seri untuk uh, rekonstruksi bedah payudara, ini uh, ini jilid pertama atau jilid jilid satu dan dua. Nanti ada jilid tiga empatnya, masih berikutnya masih ada lagi. Oh, oh, kami senang sekali, Prof. Kalau nanti akan ada kuliah selanjutnya yang mm -hmm. waktu untuk mengisi uh, kami senang sekali untuk memfasilitasinya yeah. Prof. Iya. Yeah. Karena ini uh, based on from the basic uh, dari um, Tahap-tahap yang pertama nanti um, bisa dilanjutkan tahap-tahap berikutnya untuk masalah-masalah uh, lainnya sampai yang uh, yang paling uh, the newest technology that we, we do. So these are just the 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 basic principle first, okay. and then after that we we'll can continue for um, the uh, advanced technology in breast reconstruction. 
ya Prof. Ya. Kami excited sekali Prof. Ya, terima kasih. izin Prof untuk materinya nanti penyampaian materinya 45 menit ya Prof ya ya jadi kalau nanti sesi bertanya apakah Prof uh, berkenan untuk uh, live ah, yes. ya mm -hmm. ada ada beberapa residen yang akan bertanya dan beberapa res mungkin beberapa bedah plastik dari luar Semarang yang ikut untuk bertanya Prof ya boleh oke okay. terima kasih Prof Ini kayaknya kameranya burem. Di Undip, uh, plastik surgerinya uh, ada berapa uh, orang? Uh, plastik surgerinya ada empat. Bro. Empat staffnya. Oh, ya. okay. Jadi uh, untuk craniofacial and Cranio micro. J. Jadi ada konsultan craniofacial, ada konsultan hand and micro. Mm -hmm. Nanti akan menyusul ada konsultan burn. Mm -hmm. Dan nanti sama konsultan mikro tambah lagi satu prof. Oh iya bagus. Jadi memang kalau di undip ini sementara kami pendidikan bedahnya masih general surgeon prof, tapi sedang ya. is untuk pembukaan atau di bedah plastik. Jadi ya. jadi walaupun walaupun di sini pro di general surgeon, tapi kasus bedah plastik di sini cukup banyak prof. Iya terutama kasus untuk uh, keganasan payudara CA Mame untuk bagian oh, okay. bagi di sini banyak sekali Prof dan Oke. Okay. Jadi ini sesuai dengan uh, kalau gitu kasus untuk Iya. Sangat sesuai Prof. Jadi mm -hmm. banyak kan memang kasus yang datang ke rumah sakit Karyadi ini kasus untuk CA Mame yang sudah stadium lanjut sehingga mm -hmm. pilihan Rekonstruksinya cukup terbatas mungkin yang Prof. Jadi nanti mohon sarannya Prof untuk pasien-pasien yang siapa mm -hmm. yang sudah stadium lanjut untuk rekonstruksi. Iya. Iya. Seperti ya, gimana? Uh, uh, selamat pagi Dokter Najat. Mau izin Prof di sini ada senior plastik surgeon yeah. Dokter Najat Tuloh sudah hadir di aula. Iya. Yeah. Terima kasih, selamat pagi. Sebentar saya fasilitasi untuk mic-nya, Prof. Selamat pagi, Prof. Rizal Johan. Ya, selamat pagi. Ya, perkenalkan saya Dr. Najatullah, staf di Rumah Sakit Dr. Karyadi. Ya. Terima kasih, Prof. Sudah mau sharing pengetahuan pengalaman ke kita semua. Ya, terima kasih untuk undangannya. Ya, Prof. Untuk ini, Prof, untuk operasi 
Dress rekonstruksi sendiri di Cleveland itu sudah maju sekali ya Prof ya yang ada sunset untuk flat perforator ya Prof. Iya, ya kita sudah menyambungkan untuk uh, sensorik uh, nerve uh, kita juga sudah melakukan uh, free flap DIP dengan robot. Uh, so and then we also have um, lymphedema prevention. Jadi kalau untuk uh, lymph node-nya di remove di axilla we do immediate uh, lymphatic reconstruction and if they still have lymphedema afterwards then they have we have a team that do lymphedema treatment afterwards. Ya. Yeah. Di sini kita punya tim sekarang ada 20 uh, nanti kira-kira uh, 4 5 bulan lagi ada datang 5 lagi. Jadi kira-kira 25 dari tim kita. Dari berbagai ini Prof. Berbagai... Ya. Da, jadi uh, tiga kosmetik um, uh, dua hand, dua craniofacial, uh, dua lymphatic and then selainnya micro and breast. Khususnya untuk operasinya sendiri, Prof, apakah di sana frekuensinya cukup sering berarti ya, Prof, ya, untuk operasi? Suaranya rada kecil, coba. Uh, ya. Terdengar suara saya, Prof? Iya, sekarang lah, lebih, lebih bagus kalau lebih dekat mic-nya. <laughs> oh iya, oke. Okay. Baik, Prof. Ya. Apa pertanyaannya? Uh, dari semua kasus breast cancer yang sudah dilakukan rekon, Prof, untuk hasil yang ideal itu apakah ada uh, patokan atau idealnya untuk stadium cancer yang paling baik dilakukan rekonstruksi yang sampai dilakukan sunset? Kalau paling baik yang sebelum ada cancernya, hmm. yang paling baik kalau di sini they do the genetic testing and they have the genetic test and then they don't they only have the gene they don't even have the cancer that is the most ideal then then that's a truly a prevention because then we can really prevent um people having the cancer oh. so but also uh the next thing is um the screening process is uh relatively very common so women's above 40 and uh 50s definitely above 50 is a must they have a mandatory mammogram uh, and uh, on 40s if they have um, potential um, family history of breast cancer or if they have uh, previous um, breast diseases or any kind of very unusual uh, conditions then they start at early age um, 40. Uh, but screening mammogram is the number one um important the most important step uh to get most of the patient stadium one and two uh occasionally we we still see two and three very rarely we see four uh, and then um so it, it is one and one and two is very common two and three is the next but also with the advance of chemotherapy they can downstage uh, the cancer from two to three to even uh, becoming two, or it, it is more resectable. Uh, the size of the tumor becoming smaller, or even sometimes the lymph node is actually uh, disappearing, actually. Uh, so uh, it, it is that is uh, the most important step. Okay. Oke, okay. we still wait the participant from the lecture this morning. Oke, okay. oke, okay. we still wait for uh, other participant Prof, for okay, the no problem. this morning.
So, Prof, uh, is the is your team it the breast recon team is same with the face transplant team in Cleveland? Uh, a little bit different. Um, so some of the micro people um, that join the face transplant also do the breast, uh, but there are so many different breasts that is done micro also. Uh, okay. Because we have so many um, breast oncologists, mm -hmm. and um, so and therefore we are trying to cover the number of cases. They see um, more than one thousand breast cases per year, and we do the reconstructions are about between four hundred and fifty to five hundred and fifty cases per year. Whoa. So, yeah, so we do a lot. Okay. It's quite a number, fifty years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it it is a lot. Yeah, unfortunately, a lot, but it is, it's number the number one breast, uh, the number one cancer in women in the U.S. Uh, however, uh, because of the early screening. Uh, we can certainly, we can declare that we can treat these patients efficiently. And sometimes we can even prevent them uh, in having the cancer because of uh, detection of the early gene. Mm, okay. This, uh, so screening is the most important for the... self screening and mom mammogram. So mammogram. I think uh, I had the opportunity to talk to... Uh, Mancas, that that's going to be the next, uh, the number one of uh, important step in women's health in Indonesia. Is it about getting the mammogram? Um, I, I had the opportunity to talk to Budi Sadikin and we had a, a very a good discussions about mm -hmm. what is the potential for, for the future. Yes, yes. I think this is also important. It's very important in Indonesia because mostly patients come with the advanced stage, late, uh, late mm -hmm. uh, phase stadium, and we the fibrotic of the tissue is difficult to recon. Yeah. That's okay. So basically, if you have the advanced stage, treat the cancer, but we, we always keep track uh, on the patients who had completed the cancer treatment, and we still consider them to have what we call a delayed reconstruction. Delayed. So uh, we, we tell them, don't be sad. Number one is we're going to treat the cancer first. And after that, we'll see them again, periodically, about six months, one year, mm -hmm. and offer them the reconstruction later. Okay. Yeah, because by monitoring their conditions, making sure that they don't have recurrence of the cancer, if they can really get treated really well with the chemotherapy, mm -hmm. then you still have the opportunity to do the reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now is uh, time is 6.55. Maybe we can continue with start the lecture. Uh, I please the MC open the session.
Hello, Mang. Hello, Mang. Beli Jumah dan barangnya. Eh, takut saya ada sinyal di jalan. Beli Jumah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Good morning ladies and gentlemen, professors, seniors, fellow residents, and beloved audience. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, professors, seniors, fellow residents, and beloved audience. First of all, let us pray to Almighty God for His mercy so we can gather here in this hall to attend the lecture about breast reconstruction. We would like to welcome our visiting professor by online, Professor Rizal Johan, MD, MBA, from Cleveland Clinic, Ohio, United States of America. Good morning, Prof. Selamat pagi. Selamat pagi. Terima kasih untuk undangannya. Uh, terima kasih uh, untuk rekan-rekan dan -rekan profesor dan rekan-rekan kedokteran uh, di Undip dan uh, seluruh uh, masyarakat kedokteran di Indonesia. The audience are welcome to participate in the discussion with Dr. Puji Sriani as a plastic surgeon from Karya di General Hospital as the moderator after the lecture session is done. Dr. Puji Sriani is a plastic surgeon at Karya di General Hospital, Semarang. She studied medicine at the Ponegoro University and continued specialization at plastic surgery and aesthetic reconstruction at Universitas Indonesia. Dr. Puji Sriani, the time and place is yours. Okay, so before we start our visiting lecture by online, from Professor Rizal Johan. Let me read his uh, curriculum vitae. Yep. So let us sh share screen. Professor Rizal Johan is the vice chairman of Cle Cleveland Clinic from Dermatology Plastic Surgery Institute. He is a professor of plastic surgery, Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. He underwent the education from Santa Fe Community College, Gainesville, Florida, from biology major from 1984 to 1986 and 1987 to 1990 from University of South Florida, Tampa, Florida, from biology major. He then continued to finish University of Health Science, Chicago Medical School, and finished his medical doctor degree in 1994. He then took another uh, university from Case Western University, where he had School of Management, where he finished his Master of Business Administration from 2010 and 2013. Okay, good morning, Prof. Uh, good morning. Maybe we we can start the lecture now, and you can share. Some okay. Now. Terima kasih. I will share my screen. Oke. Oke, ya. Terima kasih uh, untuk undangannya sekali lagi. So, uh, topik yang kita akan bicarakan adalah tahap-tahap uh, uh, untuk uh, management in breast cancer patients. What are the steps uh, and advances in breast reconstruction? So as uh, was mentioned uh, that uh, I, saya pergi di SMA di Jakarta, di Pangun di Luhur, dan uh, uh, setelah uh, begitu saya melanjutkan uh, di uh, college di Florida, and then medical school di Chicago. And dasar uh, pertama untuk uh, kedokteran on uh, bedahnya itu bedah umum, lima tahun, dan kemudian Uh, burn surgery untuk uh, bedah bakar, and then kemudian plastic surgery, and then uh, fellowships in, 
in microsurgery, aesthetic surgery, and then uh, also at a visiting uh, fellow in Changgang and Kent University. So um, then uh, here is my presentation. I would like to acknowledge my team members who helped me uh, as a team in management uh, of a patient with breast cancer. And if you look at uh, most of the publications uh, are listed, uh, some of my partners and also my previous residents and fellows who helped me in uh, performing the uh, publications. So uh, what are uh, the advances uh, in breast cancer? It is actually a teamwork. So the number one aspect is uh, achieving safety in oncologic treatment. So when patients are diagnosed with breast cancer, number one, we work uh, with the oncology team and how we can actually treat these patients um, efficiently. And number one, treat the cancer thoroughly or, uh, or sometimes some of the patients, uh, we can even see their family members who have the gene. So we don't even have to treat the cancer so we can even prevent from the cancer to, um, to be happening uh, in their family members. So um, screening is a very important. We, we start a screening at age 40 if they have positive family history. And certainly otherwise, um, uh, every woman are uh, mandated or mandatory to have um, screening mammogram age 50 along with self breast examinations. It's part of the routine checking when they go to the primary uh, medical doctor. So, and then after that, we work with uh, the breast surgeons or the oncologic surgeons. And when the patient is diagnosed with the breast cancer, we do it uh, as a team approach and then how we can discuss with the patients and uh, the breast surgeons how to restore the breast aesthetics. And then hopefully then we can restore some of the sensory recovery process and optimizing the quality uh, and out the quality of life and outcome for the patients. So as mentioned before, uh, this is a truly uh, a multidisciplinary aspect. When a patient come uh, to the Colibrian Clinic, our breast center, uh, they automatically will have uh, multiple appointments. They will see the breast surgeons, they will see the plastic surgeon, medical oncology, radiation oncology, genetic team. Uh, as well as uh, all the rehab and social service. It's all pre-arranged. They, sometimes they come one to two days full uh, appointments to see all members of the team. Uh, and therefore, uh, we wanna make sure we coordinate the care for the patients. Uh, it's called personalized care. Uh, we published this uh, book about personalized treatment of breast cancer. Uh, we actually, uh, we had um, this coordination with uh, Dr. Toy from Kyoto University uh, about um, uh, this book. So then managing the expectation of these patients is uh, really important. So we want to know what is uh, the understanding, what the patient understand about the cancer and what's the patient need and desire because they want, we want to know how we can reconstruct them. Um, most of the people really care about their body image. They want to be restored. They want to be reconstructed. And therefore we as a plastic surgeon really uh, play an important uh, role in restoring the quality of life for the patient. And um, then, so we want to know their health condition, making sure they are, are uh, suitable to undergo reconstructions. But some of the patients who have high BMI, uh, especially when the BMI greater than 40, or patient is actively smoking, or have very uncontrolled diabetes, uh, very bad COPD, or had previous uh, multiple surgeries, radiation, chemotherapy, we have to discuss with the patient about the risk factors. What is the potential success and failure of the reconstructions? So we have to explain, educate the patients about exploring what are the potential possibilities. Uh, so it is important that we need to know, um, choosing whether we need to do mastectomy to the patients, or we can do lumpectomy for the patient. Even with the lumpectomy, we are uh, participating in the reconstructions, meaning by doing reduction along with lumpectomy, 
we can have a better margin. The margin will be uh, a lot uh, bigger um, cutting around the tumor uh, and therefore the success rate is even better. This is very useful on patients with the larger breasts, usually with the D breast cup size or larger. And then uh, arranging the timing versus surgery or chemo first, which is new adjuvant chemotherapy, is also very useful. Therefore, this patient who sees the medical oncology, we can discuss, hey, this patient may be, can be downsized. So you can look at uh, our publications from the team, uh, determining short and long-term outcomes in patients undergoing immediate breast reconstruction following new adjuvant chemotherapy. So these are the patients who actually have stage two and three that we can downsize, downstage the cancer. Uh, and then with new adjuvant chemotherapy makes um, our job easier. Then they can uh, do the resection even easier and uh, making it even more successful, the cancer treatment and surgery and reconstruction. And then knowing after that possibility after the surgery is the patient's gonna have radiation. So we form uh, what we call it the clinical pathways and making the arrangement of the patient by the time they are diagnosed, what is the most sensible way to do the treatment? Is it uh, chemotherapy first, surgery first? And is that gonna be reconstructions right away or reconstructions later? And are they going to have radiation? So let's discuss step by step uh, along the way. So when we discuss regarding uh, reconstruction, we have to manage the expectation for, from the patients. Uh, is the patient uh, is going to have implant, which is going to be having tissue expander first and after that follow with the implant? Or can we do uh, the flap reconstructions? Should we do the flap from the abdomen or the flap from uh, the back? Uh, those are the two most common ones. Sometimes we do it from the thigh, uh, but we seldom do it from uh, the gluteal aspect anymore. So choosing the appropriate reconstruction uh, treatment, um, some patients we need to do two, step, two steps of reconstruction, two stages. We put the tissue expander first, and then after that, we put the implant. Or sometimes we do the DIEP or the TRAM, uh, or latissimus, uh, transverse upper gracilis, uh, superior gluteal, inferior gluteal. But as we mentioned before, most commonly we do the DIEP or latissimus, occasionally with transverse upper gracilis uh, flap or a PAP flap nowadays. So risk factors, we discussed before, uh, ideal patients, ideal, and most of the people are less uh, BMI less than 30, but if they have BMI greater than 40, their complication rates are great, uh, three, three folds. Uh, it's a lot more riskier when we do the reconstruction with the BMI greater than 40. So patient needs to be aware about their potential complications. What are the potential things that can happen so that they won't be uh, really uh, really upset when they have complications. They need to understand we're trying to help them. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes um, we they have comorbid factors, smoking, COPD, and um, diabetes. So we try to manage them. Sometimes we can optimize them preoperatively. We can um, manage their diabetes, uh, stop the smoking, or uh, we can have them do weight loss surgery before the reconstructions. I will discuss that a little bit uh, after this. And cancer staging, uh, staging. so uh, treatment, as mentioned before, we do the new age of chemotherapy uh, and radiation. We do, therefore, we can do immediate reconstructions or delay reconstructions. And potential complications needs to be discussed with the patient so they know what they're going to potentially uh, face during the care of the cancer. So um, we discussed regarding management on people with high BMI, meaning people are very, very uh, BMI greater than 40. Uh, we published this outcome study. So when we see these patients uh, have a huge BMI, uh, then overall flap complication or donor side complication, especially undergoing DIP free flap, uh, is uh, it's doubles 
and BMI 35 and triples in BMI greater than 40. So this is like, take a look at the example, patient who is uh, 225 pounds. So we tell the patients, go ahead and have surgery. And this patient had mastectomy, left breast, had reconstruction. And in the meantime, I send them to the weight loss program. And then they lose uh, weight from 225 pounds to 140 pounds. So 80 pounds weight loss, 85 pound weight loss, that means uh, 40 kilo or about 40 kilo. So uh, then once they already stabilized the BMI in the optimum condition, then we can do the reconstruction. So we basically take the hanging panis and then create with the DIP free flap, make a new breast. So on the bottom, you can see it before and after. So that is before the surgery and then we do delay reconstructions. So uh, basically when they present it to us, patient has high comorbid factors and we tell them, go ahead, do the cancer treatment, do the mastectomy, do the chemo, do the radiations. And I do not let them go. I put them in my list. I tell them, come back to see me every three to six months. I will encourage them to do the weight loss. I will send them to other doctors who can help them to do weight loss program. And we'll tell them, if you can meet the requirements, we can optimize you, then we do the reconstructions. And uh, basically we are encouraging them to be healthier and also be successful in the reconstruction. Same thing with this one, uh, BMI 44, 270 pounds. That means uh, 135 kilo probably. And then they lose weight. And then now the BMI is uh, 170, so 100, 100 pound weight loss. So you can see the upper that is before, now below is after. There is a two years follow up after uh, the first initial presentation. So, therefore, we uh, treat them appropriately, reduce our risk. Uh, and um, this is another one patient who had weight loss and uh, performed the reconstruction. So, patients who are expected to have radiation, uh, sometimes we don't want to radiate. Uh, our tissue, because otherwise they get fibrosis, they have complications of a very, very valuable flap that we do. So then we do a delayed immediate, meaning so we put tissue expander first, have them radiate, and then we can remove the tissue expander and then we can put the DIP free flap. Um, or a patient with the advanced stage, aggressive, progressive cancer. And then as we mentioned before, have them do the mastectomy, and do the radiation and chemo and radiation, then we do the reconstructions afterwards. Typically, we would wait six months at the minimum after radiation. So this is an, an example of that patient, patient with the right breast cancer, and have them do a skin sparing mastectomy. They put the tissue expander and undergo uh, chemo and radiations. And then, um, and then after the radiation is completed, uh, then uh, we take out the tissue expander. You can see the free flap, the DIEP on the right. Uh, and then we, uh, uh, we did the nipple reconstructions on the right side. And then uh, she has a very reasonable result for the reconstruction. And this is, you can see the progressions before and after, oblique view and uh, the frontal view. So patient with advanced cancer, this malignant uh, phalloidous tumor, uh, the tumor is relatively large. And then during the observation, they actually during the, the, the planning of the treatment, the, the, the tumor grew, it's even bigger. So we tell them, go ahead and do the mastectomy and radiation. And we keep track on the patient. We tell them that we want you to be healthy and uh, we want to optimize you. Don't be sad because we can still reconstruct you. And then uh, we take the DIP free flap. You can see the tumor progressions and then uh, take the DIP, uh, make the new breast on the right side and the nipple reconstruction. So those are the stages in this type of patients.
So we also did a study. What are the factors influencing the aesthetic outcome and quality of life on all our previous patients uh, for the breast reconstructions? So uh, most in the US are about 100,000 breast reconstructions performed each year. Uh, that is the statistics from 2014 and still true uh, even 10 years, a decade later. So about 100, uh, 120,000. So that's a lot of, and in, in here, uh, we do that about 600 breast reconstructions per year. So, and then we evaluate, we're looking at our uh, performance. Uh, how is the patient satisfaction and the outcome? And we did the rescue, we're looking at our patients um, at the subset, uh, it's about 2009, 2011, patient who had radiation, patient who had bilateral or unilateral reconstructions, patient having the implant or tissue reconstructions, we look at their results. And we identified 820 patients at that time. And uh, we looking at a subset, 261 patients who, uh, who had uh, completed the breast cues. And then we looking at their photos, 147 of them. And it turns out that people who underwent autologous reconstruction with tissue reconstruction, they are happier, they have a, a better result in their outcome than the implant-based reconstructions uh, based on the 820 questionnaires that was sent. So on patients who had bilateral versus unilateral mastectomy, uh, they feel a little bit more symmetrical. They feel a little bit more uh, satisfied in their outcome in the bilateral reconstructions than the unilateral. And also patients who didn't have radiation, they also have a better outcome in uh, non-radiated reconstruction. So in looking at their photos, we can see about how uh, they perceive, or we actually, we have the medical students, residents, and doctors to take a look at the results. Uh, they also um, see that the autologous reconstructions display a better result. People who did not have radiation also have a better outcome, as well as people who have bilateral reconstruction. So Cleveland Clinic, we actually one of the first team in the US who performed the nipple spray mastectomy. Um, most of the people in the past, uh, they worried that if we are keeping the nipple, then the cancer may spread uh, from the nipple or the existing pre-existing duct underneath uh, the nipple. Uh, so we did uh, the first studies. Uh, so we first performed the nipple spraying mastectomy in 2001. So that's more than 20 years ago. We did the six year outcome data and then uh, we able to prove the oncologic safety. And we basically are really taking out all the ducts from underneath the nipple, but we have to be very careful not to devascularize the nipple. So making sure that we don't, don't be too aggressive. Um, then after that, I performed the eight-year follow-up study and outcome uh, on patients un who underwent nipple sparing mastectomy. And we're looking at their appearance, symmetry, color, positions, and texture. They are happier. Certainly at that time, they, they, was, they, they were able to say that I still missing sensation and arousal, even though we're keeping the nipple. Well, that's true because we, during the mastectomy, we cut the nerve that goes through the breast parenchyma on the way to the nipple. And therefore, now we are finding the nerve underneath the nipple and then we are trying to maintain or trying to preserve uh, at, uh, most of the nerve that goes to the breast parenchyma provided that it's not too close to the tumor. So this is an example of a patient who had a, a, a prophylactic mastectomy with nipple sparing, and then we can perform the implant-based reconstructions. Uh, actually, patients are very happy with uh, the, the result, uh, especially preserving the nipple area complex, meaning that they don't feel that they truly have a mastectomy. And considering the placement of the incision at the IMF or inframary fold, it's actually hide the scar from the breast. And so in the past, we need to do tissue expander, but now we can do one step direct to implant reconstructions. We can do that. Uh, certainly we do it with the dermal matrix or some type of 
soft tissue supplementations in uh, order to provide uh, the breast mount. This is an example patient who had uh, uh, breast cancer um, on the right and then underwent bilateral nipple spray mastectomy. We provide, we make the breast pocket with incision on the inframe fold. This is the pocket creation. And then we uh, place uh, assessment of the implant. What is the appropriate, the most appropriate size for the implant without compromising the circulations? Because if you put the implant is too big, then the pressure of the implant will limit the perfusion to the nipple or the skin. And therefore we want to make sure that we don't put the implant that is too big, but we don't want also to put the implant that is too small. And uh, therefore we uh, oftentimes do the perfusion test with the ICG, taking it, you can see this is the video looking at the ICG itself. And uh, you can see it has a good perfusion on both nipples and a good even perfusion to both uh, subdermal plexus uh, on both breasts. So how do we usually reconstruct the breasts? Um, well, um, started about more than 10 or 15 years ago, we put it underneath the muscles. While in the past, the classic article, we always put it underneath the muscle because we cannot rely on the skin. So we put it underneath the muscles to give a, a good uh, projections. Uh, we place a dermal matrix on the uh, area of inframe fault. And therefore we can place the implant or tissue expander underneath the uh, pectoralis muscle and put the dermal ma matrix. And we suture up and this is the immediate result one month uh, after the surgery. And this is, you can see before and after, um, actually because of uh, postpartum of after or after the pregnancy, and the breast skin usually is a little bit looser and they lose the volume of the breast parenchyma so we can restore their volume again uh, with the implant. And here, there's another uh, example. The upper part is before the surgery. The lower part is after the surgery. This is the same thing, before and after. And however, now we recognize if we put the implant underneath the muscle, um, a lot of patients in long term uh, have animation deformity, uh, it causing a little bit more discomfort and tightness and pain of having implant underneath the muscles. And the surgery by cutting the muscles actually cause uh, a lot of discomfort and longer recovery process. And um, it takes a little bit uh, some time for the patients to recover. You can see this is what we call it animation deformity. You can see when they contract the pectoralis and it caused the deformity uh, of uh, the implant. This is another one. This is another animation deformity. Then when they do the workout, they do all the different daily activity. When they contract the muscles, it causes unusual sensations and uh, deformation of the breast. So, we started to do this prepectoral implant reconstructions, putting it above or in front of the muscles, uh, either a single stage or two stage reconstruction. And by doing this, patients recover faster, less pain, and, uh, and they don't have animation deformity. And the good thing is when we do this, when they radiate it, uh, it less radiation causes a lot of fibrosis on the pectoralis muscle. So if we don't radiate the muscles, they are actually less uh, capsule contractures on uh, the, the implant underneath the muscle. Certainly the disadvantages, if you have very thin skin, you can see the rippling of the implant and therefore you need to do lipografting over uh, underneath the skin. And you need to have dermal, dermal matrix, a larger piece in order to support the implant. So that was, uh, we started in 2018. We do the prepectoral reconstructions and we use the uh, dermal matrix and do the fat grafting um, afterwards. Uh, ideally we do this in the breast that is not too large, but now we have been doing it in a D breast cup size. 
basically whatever appropriate for the breast um, uh, envelope. Uh, and actually, uh, we can do it also patients who are, who are planning to have radiation treatment uh, and minimize uh, the animation deformity or a patient who comes with animation deformity we oftentimes now remove the implant from underneath the muscle and then put it over the muscle. So contraindications, we don't want to do it in smokers because then when we are uh, elevating the skin flap and putting pressure on the skin with the implants are uh, going to be difficult to heal and patients under control, uh, un under uh, uncontrolled diabetes is actually also going to be challenging on their healing process. Or if the mastectomy skin flap there is too thin, uh, or having inflammatory breast cancer, or the tumor that is too close to the muscles, we don't want to put the implant above uh, the muscles and then making them difficult to have uh, detection for the recurrence. So this is the marking. Typically, we mark uh, the breast borders, we mark the IMF, we mark the meridian of the breast. And this is patient preoperatively. And then you can see this is the uh, placement of tissue expander or implant uh, with the dermal matrix. And then we put it into the pocket, pocket um, uh, inside the mastectomy skin flap. Then you can see before on the left, after on the right. And you can see the oblique view. This is before and after. So we can really restore the breast aesthetics uh, very close to what is uh, relatively normal. So we can discuss now in patients who do not want to have implant or who have adequate um, adipose tissue on the abdomen, uh, then they, a lot of time they request to have a DIP free flap or reconstruction using their own tissue from the abdomen. Uh, suddenly, by utilizing well vas vascularized um, adipose tissue from the abdomen, uh, a pa patient will have very nice, uh, warm uh, breast reconstruction, uh, feeling almost like normal. And we can minimize the donor site morbidity uh, by preservation most of the rectus abdominis. Uh, we do the perforator and we do the meticulous dissection. and we want to make sure uh, looking for the right perforator. And uh, if we we are uh, people who are beginning use, using this technique, it may take them a little bit longer, but after doing them a while, if they knew uh, the anatomy, uh, then you can be efficient. And uh, then if you choose the right perforator, minimize the potential development of fat necrosis. So potential complication to do this, uh, we, flap failure, uh, it can be 1%, maybe 2%. Uh, but if you do a lot, you will see potential uh, difficulty, especially on the left side. Sometimes they had radiation. Uh, the internal memory vessels on the left chest is smaller. And if they're radiated a uh, little bit, uh, very uh, easily um, tear or having uh, uh, this, uh, intimate dissection, uh, so we have to be very careful in placement of the suture uh, in performing the anastomosis. Donor side morbidity, you can have hernia or bulging, 2 to 5%. Uh, not necessarily hernia, but you can have bulging. Uh, now to do um, minimize the donor side morbidity, um, we can do this under robot on appropriate uh, patients. So we can discuss that in future uh, advances in reconstructions uh, later on and a different time. Uh, certainly recovery uh, in the beginning, if you do a lot of dissections, it can be a concern, but most of our DIP free flap now go home in two days. We do the free flap on Wednesday, they go home on Friday night. Um, so uh, they can travel, uh, go back to their home, sleep in their own bed um, by day number three. Uh, the key point is we have to know the anatomy. Um, I routinely uh, do the CT angiogram and also do a 3D print interpretations of the CT angiogram. And so we know exactly which vessels that we're gonna use. 
So this is an example of the CT angiogram. You can see the perforators right by the umbilicus. This is the perforators underneath the muscles. This is ideal because then you don't have to cut into the muscle. There's no intramuscular dissection. You can see this is vessels going through there. So next slide. So then I do this 3D print from that CT angiogram. This is the exact representations of the soft tissue and the muscles. That is the rectus abdominis. And then you can see as we reflect it down, that's the muscles on both sides. And you can see the vessels that was uh, interpreted from the CT angiogram. You can see those vessels going in the medial side of the rectus abdominis, going underside of that muscle. That is the best perforator if you can find that, then you don't have to do the muscle, muscle dissection. And this is actually the criteria for the robotic surgery. So in the, in the future one, I'm giving a lecture about robotic in the IP preflap, then that's part of my lecture for that. Then you can see minimize truly just a small opening. So we take that uh, 3D print, use it as a stamp on the abdomen. So you know exactly where the location of the vessel, where you want to find. So make it easier. So I tell everybody in the team who is going to uh, do the operation with me, and then we know exactly where to do, where we can go fast, where we can need to be slow and trying to make sure we don't injure the vessel. And here it is, and we, we are uh, putting and stamping down, making sure that uh, like a stamp uh, and know exactly where the vessels are. Here, uh, CT angiogram, and you can see the vessels mimicking the CT angiogram. You can uh, pull the muscles, uh, just separate the muscles, making sure we don't injure the nerve or motor nerve, and then uh, take the, uh, the pedicle uh, going through the muscle. Here the result uh, on uh, the DIP free flap, uh, skin sparing with uh, the nipple reconstruction. And here's another patient with bilateral mastectomy with bilateral DIP free flap and uh, the nipple reconstructions. And this is nipple sparing mastectomy uh, with the DIP free flap. And you can see the uh, abdominal incisions that all the way across. Uh, this is a patient uh, with um, bilateral DIP with the nipple sparing mastectomy. We hide the incisions actually uh, in the inframary fold. And if they have uh, adequate uh, abdominal tissue, and sometimes we can get a little bit uh, more volume and better result. So in conclusion, um, achieving success in patients undergoing uh, breast cancer treatment, uh, we can uh, discuss regarding uh, cancer treatment along with the teams that is involved uh, treating the patients from the oncology, surgical oncology, medical oncology, uh, radiation oncology, geneticists, uh, everybody put uh, their input, uh, how to achieve success in patients with breast cancer, and then uh, achieving uh, their cancer treatment is the number one goal, making sure we are successful uh, to complete the cancer treatment. And in the meantime, uh, we also try to do uh, restoration of uh, breast aesthetics, uh, either immediately at the time of mastectomy or delayed afterwards after the cancer treatment is completed. The goal is improving the outcome and quality of life, the patients uh, to regain their uh, social and self-confidence. So thank you, this, this is part of my team uh, who does the surgery with me. And uh, that's Cleveland uh, in the spring. Uh, that's not yet, uh, it's still snowing outside, actually snow uh, in the last two days. Uh, so uh, it's definitely look different than that. All right. So.
Okay. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Very. This is amazing presentation with the amazing result. Uh, now we continue with the session of question and answer, maybe from the participant in the on site. I. Doctor. Okay. Uh, hello. Hello, selamat pagi. Selamat pagi, Prof. Johan. Thank you for the very excellent lecture. So I'm from Bali, Nyoman. Just yes, uh, one question. I asked yes. regarding the vein that uh, uh, you encounter in uh, the IP because sometimes I just found one. And how many vein that you need uh, 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 to anastomose the vein for the uh, adequate... Uh, uh, yes, for the chest. Yeah. Yes. So when we are dissecting uh, the DIP free flap, uh, certainly if we chase all the way down to the iliac, uh, we can get the two vena commentants into one. But uh, do we need to go all the way down to one? Um, and then we can have the two veins. And then the next question, do we need two actually do the anastomosis of both veins. If we have sufficient length on the internal memory vein, then we can split the internal memory vein one as antegrade flow and one as retrograde flow. Uh, then we can easily do both or sometimes we just do one. In fact, uh, there is uh, Adis over there. Uh, he's actually, uh, he did some of the cadaver dissection with me in trying to look at uh, the paper and see if we can uh, promote that we not necessarily do the dissections all the way down to the iliacs because we, by pulling and uh, trying to dissect all the way down to the iliac, it costs a lot of pain and might be causing some nerve injury, chronic pain. So if we have sufficient um, suitable comparable diameter of the internal memory uh, artery and vein to the suitable caliber of the DIEP pedicle caliber, then that should be enough. Uh, so that's uh, something that uh, we are looking into. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Nyoman. Uh, he is a plastic surgeon from Yudhoyana University, Bali. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. we continue with another question, please. From resident, maybe. Uh, stand up and good. stand up and louder, please. Good morning, Prof. Jan. Uh, my name is Krishna from. Uh, surgery resident of University of Diponegoro, like to ask you, uh, as I see that the pre-assessment of the operation of the breast reconstruction is really advanced in Cleveland Clinic, so it's is that a mandatory we need to do before the breast reconstruction because it's really advanced and still not relevant in Indonesia, or we can predict uh, what we need to do uh, based on the anatomy. It's uh, similar or typical in every person. Thank you. Prof. Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, it's a bagus sekali question. It, uh, banyak uh, rumah sakit di Amerika juga tidak menggunakan CT angiogram, tidak punya untuk fasilitas membuat 3D print. So if you know the anatomy, if you, if you can do it, you're comfortable. Uh, yes, you can do it. But for me, for teaching purposes, for my residents and students and the fellows, it's easier for me to put in their mind what to expect, what to anticipate for the surgery. So it, it, it is part of the teaching process and also part of uh, making it more efficient for our team to work together. Uh, uh, I think by doing that, um, 
I can anticipate it is going to be more challenging or is this going to be a lot easier? And if it is unilateral reconstruction, I can know which side. Is it the left side is better or the right side is better? So uh, definitely for us, because we have the opportunity to do that, um, it, it is a good way to communicate about planning and a good way of trying to make decision which way is would be best for the patient. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you. Another question from Dr. Rani Septrina from CS of Plastic Surgeon from the Pajajaran University, Bandung. Please, Dr. Rani, you may ask. Good morning, Prof. Rizal Johan. Terima kasih. Selamat pagi. Selamat pagi. Mungkin selamat malam di uh, yeah. Tiffen. Yeah. Baik, terima kasih, Mbak Puji. It's um, as a um, as a um, plastic surgeon in Bandung, I hardly uh, doing a uh, breast reconstruction. Karena orang Sunda tidak mau dilakukan breast reconstruction pasca mastectomy. Um, but the the paradigm the paradigm is changing. Like today, I'm doing um, some of a reconstruction, but they don't really want to have a diet flap or um, or, or any kind of implant, but they only want to um, do um, lipo filling. So the first question is, um, do you have any tips and tricks with the lipo filling uh, yes. for, for breast reconstruction? And the second question is, um, I, uh, the statement of your statement about um, preserving um, the nerve for, for a nipple uh, mammary, um, areola it's um i think it's challenging um also can you uh, give me give us some some of the tip and tricks and um that's this uh, the first uh, second question and i will follow with the third question later yeah so let's uh, address the first question the first question is about how to do breast construction just doing lipo filling Yes. So uh, number one, uh, making sure the mastectomy skin flap is not too tight. So you might want to lose, uh, you might want to leave some of loose skin uh, that is still relatively able to accommodate some of the lipografting. But also you have to tell the patient what it is the expected volume that you can manage with uh, the breast reconstruction with just lipografting. Because if it is a balance, how much fat that you can put that is non-vascularized? Because if you put too much without vas good vascularized tissue, then it will become cysts, oil cysts, or becoming uh, necrotic fat that is becoming a, a heart lump. So it, it is a balance. Sometimes you want to tell them, you might need to repeat it, uh, doing it two stages occasionally three stages. So uh, we see that uh, often, some, not often, but sometimes we see that. So uh, we can do that. And also you can simulate uh, the mastectomy skin flap. You might also make a wise pattern or a T incisions. And if you manipulate the T incisions, make a little bit more tighter on the T, make the breast a little bit more conical, rather than having a true straight line in the mid portion of the breast. If you do mid straight line on the breast, it's hard to make a conical shape. If you design with the oncology team, making it a wise pattern or T incisions, and then later on, as you fat graph, you make tighter on the base of the T, inverted T, then it will make a little bit more a conical shape. That's actually, uh, it works uh, really well on some patients who do not want or who's not suitable to undergo uh, major reconstruction. And Perfect. second one is about the, the nerve. Yeah, the nerve is uh, it's not that easy yet. So even I'm trying to teach a lot of different people from a lot of different medical centers in the U.S., uh, doing a lot of lectures about that and trying to promote uh, about this uh, portion of the reconstructions. Uh, it, it is take a, quite a bit of um, 
um, knowing the anatomy and then doing a lot of practice, the learning curve a little bit uh, more, it's a little bit tougher. So hopefully in the future, I can try to do some kind of um, visualization of the nerve, uh, doing some almost like an ICG uh, uh, injections and then visualize the nerve. Um, I think uh, we can uh, make it easier for the people to utilize that in the future. Perfect, thank you, Prof. Johan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and the third question is because um, uh, 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 Bandung, my institution is the one of the two uh, um, sampling project, uh, the two pioneer project for robotic surgery. I also interested in how you perform robotic surgery for um, um, for plastic surgery reconstruct reconstruction. Yeah, it, it is still on on the beginning phase. We are still learning too, uh, mm -hmm. but certainly in the future lectures, I can share it with you. Uh, number one, knowing the uh, appropriate patient for that, knowing what perforators. Can we do it in one perforator? Can we do two where there is, that is two perforators that is close to each other? Uh, because uh, like today, we actually went to have a practice with a uh, robot in the cadaver. We actually trying to do it in the preperitoneal plane. So we uh, put a part, don't puncture the peritoneum and insufflate the space between the peritoneum and the muscles and the sub Q. And then by doing that, and then we push uh, uh, the peritoneum down and then look for the vessels underneath it and then start doing the dissection. So it, it is a learning process for everyone, uh, but we can discuss that on the next lecture. Uh, definitely there is something that I can discuss uh, further. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Johan, Prof. Johan. Um, have a good Thank sleep you. after this uh, lecture. Terima kasih, Mbak Puji. Terima kasih. Uh, another question from Dr. Afandi from, he is, a, he is a plastic surgeon from Mawardi Hospital Solo. Uh, he actually asked in the chat, maybe I will read the chat. After we do the nipple sparing mastectomy and we don't have the acellular dermal matrix, are they, uh, is there any other way uh, to prevent the shrinking skin, to prevent the contracted skin, Prof? So actually, uh, there's also very good questions. And when I give these lectures uh, in my colleagues in South America, uh, in Brazil and Chile, um, and uh, Peru um, and Argentina, actually. Um, in Argentina and Brazil, they have performed some of this nipple sparing mastectomy and reconstructions without dermal matrix. Uh, they just use it in the sub -cube. But the uh, the uh, really the important part is the sub -Q has to be really good, uh, not too thin. Um, so if you look at other places, uh, for example, in Europe, uh, they don't have dermal matrix of human products. So they use dermal matrix of, uh, from animal products. So currently available, that is ship product or bovine uh, or uh, swine product. But now we are starting to open up even some uh, perspective of looking at other products for synthetic material, which is absorbable, a bioabsorbable material, which is combination of PDS suture uh, that is made into the matrix. Um, and um, so hopefully that once the data of that will be more available, uh, we can prove that we can still do this without having dermal matrix that is a biological product. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you. Other question from Dr. Rahman Yara Pramanasari. Uh, Uh, 
Uh, udah boleh bagus ya yeah, silakan ya yeah, ya yeah, 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 good evening Prof Johan I'm Rahma I'm plastic surgeon from Surabaya Bertani I'm um, studying in South Korea so uh, according uh, thank you for the great lecture and this is about the ADM using so I because I'm studying in here I get uh, see a lot of um, DTI using ADM which is not very common in our country So that's why I really want to ask, is there any substitutional, I think it's the same with previous Dr. Afandi's question about using the, is there any substitutional material for for achieve more affordable price for the tissue coverage? Because sometimes the mastectomy flap is very thin, so we need to something to cover it up. And also, is there um, any difference between covering only the anterior part or Is it better if we covered everything like the wonton type style of yeah. covering the, the 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 implant? Maybe um, is there any experience from your experience, Professor John? So uh, I, I do it both ways. Uh, yeah. But if the implant is small enough, that I try to do it all round because number one, it's easier to put it all round because I do the anchoring suture four points and then put it in and then do it as a parachute technique. So that is the easiest way and I can do it relatively uh, minimal time. Versus if you put it on the anterior part, you have to do a lot of suturing one by one. So a little bit less efficient. Um, and also when you I put it all around, the posture uh, at the back of the implant where you have the dermal matrix is almost stabilizing if they actually incorporate in the chest wall they actually hold the implant a little bit better so first of you suture it if you have a broken suture then it will lose in certain areas of the breast and that is my preference certainly everybody has different preference so um but the number one rule the mastectomy skin flap has to be Uh, not too thin, well vascularized. So sometimes I see patients, uh, your valid question is this, what if you see a patient with the skin flap that is too thin? So then I tell them, no, we, we don't do the reconstruction now. Let it heal, let it declare. Sometimes I have them come back and then if the skin alive, that's fine. And then I sometimes put the fat grafting first, gain the substance, and put it a little bit thickening on the sub Q. When it feels safe, then you can start thinking about now the reconstruction. I think that is something that we can think about if you don't have any material. Perfect, thank you very much, Professor Han. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Dr. Rahmaniar. Uh, we have uh, some question from resident Prof. Uh, please. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Thank you, Professor, for your great yeah. presentation. Uh, I have a question. Please my, say your name, please. Uh, let me introduce my name. My name is Arya Bintang Safari from uh, Surgery Department, Universitas Diponegoro. I have a question: Is what is the difference between natural tissue and implants, and which choice will look more like a natural breast? Thank you. Yeah, it's a very good question because patients will ask that. Which one should they use? So if they have adequate adipose tissue in the abdomen, um, a lot of times they want to get rid of the abdominal tissues, almost like a semi tuck, but then it's not exactly like a tummy tuck. Uh, so, and also by having uh, adipose tissue that is vascularized, it is warm. Um, so. It, it, it is a, a live tissue that you put it up over there. So that is a true plastic surgery uh, technique that is you are replacing the missing tissue 
with a tissue that is most likely mimicking uh, the missing natural uh, tissue that God created for you. So uh, if you put implant, certainly implant is a, a filler. Uh, number one, it doesn't have vascularization. So when the weather is cold, sometimes the patient will feel the coldness. And the autologous tissue or the tissue of the abdomen, when it's a vascularized, you don't have to worry in the future about changing the implant versus implant. In about 10, 12 years, there's a 10% chance that you need to replace the implant in 10 years. There's currently and any patients who are receiving the implant, there is a new FDA rule and guidance. We have to give them a pamphlets or uh, uh, information about implants that implant is not going to be there for your lifetime. At one point in your lifetime, the implant needs to be replaced, removed, or modify or exchange. Uh, that is a requirement for us as a plastic surgeons need to give that information, making sure the patient's aware about that situation. Okay. Thank you for the answer, Prof. Another question yep. from President. Okay. Good morning, uh, Professor. Uh, my name is Sebastian. Uh, I'm a general surgery resident from Diponegoro University. I want to ask you a question. Uh, how is the strength of the implant of the newly breast? Can the implant burst easily with outside force, for example, a car accident uh, and etc.? Thank you, Professor. That's a good question too, because that's a common question from patients. So actually when having implant on your chest, when you have a car accident, uh, then there's, I think there's some published uh, data about the extent of injury of your inside the thorax, then actually it's almost your airbag. So this is a silicon bag that is protecting your heart or your great vessels or having a direct impact from your chest going to the steering wheel or your dashboard. So if you have a car accident and you have the breast implant, more likely that you have less injury to your intrathoracic structure. And so it is uh, your... Uh, safety device in addition to the airbag but we don't we don't recommend to test it <laughs> thank you bro uh, thank you uh, other question from the student in U 11 Maret university uh, please uh, aulia you may ask live Uh, uh, I'm going to ask a question regarding the uh, procedures. Uh, what is usually being put into consideration in choosing to use uh, the IEP flap instead of a latissimus dorsi flap for breast reconstruction? And is, is there any superiority from one technique over the other? Thank you, Prof. So uh, typically, we, we try to do DIP if possible. Number one, because the latissimus usually do not give adequate volume. And latissimus, you still need to use muscle. And latissimus, sometimes you need to still supplement with implant. So if you can have adequate adipose tissue in the abdomen, and especially if the patient wants to get rid of the adipose tissue from the abdomen, extra fat from the abdomen, then that will be the primary choice. That's the most common one. Uh, but um, some people who had multiple abdominal surgeries, then their abdomen is not suitable for that surgery. Then we use the, the latissimus. Or if you think that they radiated it pretty badly and you worry about uh, managing uh, doing anastomosis with a very heavily radiated chest, um, then certainly uh, then you can do the pedicle latissimus because then you don't have to worry about anastomosis. Uh, that's a very good question. Okay. Thank you for the explanation. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any questions again from the audience in the aula? Okay. You may ask. This one is resident also. 
Good evening, Professor Rizal Johan. Yeah. Uh, please introduce okay. yourself. My name is Sindhu Nugroho Mukti. I'm from General Surgeon Resident from Diponegoro University. May I ask you a question? How long will the recovery period be and what kind of help the patient will be need? And one, one question, uh, will aging affect the reconstructed breast? Thank you, Professor. Yeah, so good. Um, so let's go over about recovery on the implant breast reconstruction. The implant breast reconstructions uh, nowadays, most of the time, 80% of them, they go home the same day. They don't even stay in the hospital. They do the mastectomy, we put the implant, they go home the same day, shower the next day. Uh, for the DIP, as mentioned, they stay in the hospital for about two days, um, then they go home day number three or the, uh, two and a half days or, or second day evening. Um, and recovery process, we tell them not to do uh, a lot of uh, heavy work for about a month to take a month to recover. Um, uh, what was the next question again? How will so the yeah. reconstructed brace? Oh, the aging process. Yes, the aging process. So certainly aging process, the DIP free flap will do some ptosis, will have gravity. Um, the implant will be less change in the aging process. That's true, especially if you have radiation, uh, it will uh, look a little bit more uh, uplifted. So definitely um, that's true. Okay, so, so the breast reconstruction will affect where the aging process needs. Yeah. yeah. Oh, other question from resident? Okay, this is the uh, other resident. Okay. Uh, good morning and good evening, sir. My name is Apricia from resident from University of Diponegoro. I have a question. Mm. Will, recon, will reconstruction intern with the therapy such as chemo or radiation therapy? And what if uh, the patient have a metastase from other organ? Will it uh, make um, an effect from the breast reconstruction? Thank you. So if you have, so there, there are two different scenarios. Oh, scenario number one, if you have breast cancer and then you have metastasis, then you want to know if the metastasis is, is solitary or multiple different places. Uh, but most of the time then if it is uh, metastasis, then especially going to the bone, going to the liver is gonna be difficult and sometimes goes to the brain. Uh, so we, we have to monitor first where is the mat. So if it is stadium four, it's going to be a little bit more challenging. But actually, I did uh, several reconstructions in patients who had uh, late stage three and um, early stage four and man manageable, what they call it, manageable stage four, and they are undergoing chemotherapy for life and they want to do reconstruction. So we have to be very careful in doing reconstruction in those kind of patients, because as you know, patients with active cancers, they can have uh, thrombosis, they can develop uh, blood clots. So you have to know, making sure that your reconstruction is not taking too long. You have to be efficient. You have to manage uh, your timing appropriately. And you have to declare in those situations the risk and the benefit of your reconstruction or operations, not only with the patient, but also with family member. Uh, because if you do harm on the patients, the family, family may not be happy. So you have to tell the risk and the benefit to the patients and the family. Okay. Thank you for the answer, Rob. Uh... We have a uh, Dr. Parintosa, uh, one of the participants in this lecture. May maybe Dr. Parintosa have a question or comment for this lecture, Doctor? Thank you, Dr. Puji. Good evening, Prof. Johan. Yeah. Very happy to meet oh, you again. You. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
I have a, maybe I have a question about the manage the management, Prof. Yes. Uh, you know that in Indonesia we didn't have a lot of case for a reconstruction the DIEP. I think Dr. Dewi is Dr. Rian and also not 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 lot of uh, uh, center doing the DIEP lab, and uh, also we we plastic surgeon is do do the surgery from the top of the head to the toe but uh, we didn't have an organ so the patient uh, that we uh, reconstruct is referred by oncologic and another specialty and then uh, my question about the uh, how to how you started the 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 excellent team for uh, manage the patient because uh, I think in Indonesia we 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 are in the this 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 uh, this point we, yes. we started the the management for the patient for the for the team. Thank you, brother. Yes, so that is a very good question, uh, Ocha. So uh, we have to be really as a plastic surgeon, we have to be engaging, uh, really work closely together. So we have a weekly we call it a tumor board, weekly tumor board. Then every week we discuss uh, new patients and especially challenging patients. And those patients will be discussed about planning, management from oncology aspect, uh, medical oncology, whether the chemotherapy or surgical treatments and surgical planning and reconstructions. So we look at the patient as a whole we are an active participant and then we tell them, hey, yes, we can do reconstructions. We cannot do reconstruction. What kind of reconstructions? If you want to do reconstruction, we manage about timing. So talking about new adjuvant chemotherapy, some of the patients with stage two, stage three cancers. So they said, okay, these patients need to undergo chemotherapy first. We shrink down the tumor and we start actually looking. So I asked the questions to the team. When do you anticipate the, the chemotherapy will be completed? When the chemotherapy completed, then usually we'll give the patients at about four weeks, five weeks, at maximum six weeks recovery process from the chemo. So I'll start looking of the surgical date with the, the general surgeon, when they want to do the mastectomy, if we can do reconstruction at the same time with them, knowing that is actually maybe two months from now or maybe a little bit more from now. We actually say, hey, let's pick a date. We are, this is the date we are going to commit with you. This is doing the reconstruction. So we are engaging with them uh, from the time. So uh, actually I engage with them regarding even the list. Patients come to your hospital with the breast cancer. You need to know, actually, we are actually actively knowing that uh, how many patients coming? How, what are the diagnoses? When they are, uh, is it going to be possibility needing uh, reconstructions or not? So we actively engage in the patients coming, even being seen. Patient without being seen, we know who are coming, uh, who are undergoing um, uh, MRI biopsy. When they have biopsy, what is the status of the cancers? And, and therefore be uh, discussed with the tumor board how to manage that patients. Um, so uh, it, it is a lot of work, but, um, but it is, uh, the, the sooner you engage with them, uh, the more you are engaged with them, uh, the more beneficial for, uh, for the whole team. Same thing when you do head and neck cancer, right? You are also all involved with the head and neck cancer treatment. Uh, and then you involve again, oh, not only removing of the cancer, is it going to be having a radical neck dissection? Is it going to having parotidectomy? Is it a superficial or complete parotidectomy? Is it the nerves are going to be removed in the face? So are we going to have a bone reconstructions? Uh, is it going to be intraoral mucosa, uh, extraoral? Uh, so same thing, we, we are doing from that principle uh, engaging from the diagnosis of the tumor management and uh, anticipations about the treatment process. But that, that is a very uh, good question. Uh, and same thing, we do it with orthopedic, with their sarcoma team. Uh, we en actively engage in the sarcoma team. So, And therefore, we have a lot of teams that actually 
we put people a specific team that is dedicated managing all these specific cancer treatments okay prof thank you for your thank attention you. and looking forward for the next presentation thank yeah. you okay thank okay. you everyone thank you prof uh, uh we have a two other question again okay. if you don't mind mm -hmm. first with dr dewi from Dharmais hospital maybe yep. this dr dewi and after yeah. that uh, we have a dr gina from Good evening, Prof. Uh, Johan. Yeah. Uh, very happy to see you here. Happy to see you from, again. Yeah. Uh, virtually. Uh, sorry, I I joined your lecture a bit late because I'm in the world already. Okay. Uh, That's so okay. I have a question. Uh, I have with my breast team like uh, Ryan and uh, oncologic surgeon. Uh, we do. Uh, some uh, diet for app and also partial breast reconstruction with TDAP and light cap flap. Uh, and for the diet flap, sometimes uh, in uh, for in for diet flap, sometimes we use uh, ICG to evaluate mm -hmm. whether we need uh, turbocharge or supercharge uh, to prevent venture ingestive. And my question yeah. is, do you routinely use ICG to evaluate uh, not only for uh, zone four, but also for uh, whether the flap need uh, more drainage? Yeah. Do you routinely uh, use ICG to evaluate whether we need to add the fin, uh, turbo, turbo right. charge or supercharge? Yeah, so definitely, um, well, when the, in the beginning, when the ICG uh, was available, we play around with it, we use more frequently. Now we use less and less, but it is a good tool and we are in trouble. We utilize it to analyze it. Um, so uh, definitely it's a good tool to use it. But however, for knowing the flap is congestions or the flap uh, needs to be uh, tubular charge or supercharged, uh, additional venous drainage. When you are dissecting the DIP and you also, um, I, I routinely have my team make sure we preserve the superficial inferior gastric vessels. And then not only if we can find the artery, yes, we find the artery, but usually the vein, we keep it long. So at the end of the dissection of the EIP, if your superficial inferior gastric is really engorged full, it is begging to be supercharged. That's by itself, it's giving you a sign that it wants to be having additional outflow. Um, so, uh, and therefore, yes. But if you have the ICG, use it until you really feel comfortable with it. Um, it's good to know how many perforators um, if I wrote a paper about um, what is management utilization of superficial inferior pegastric uh, using the ICG, so you can take a look and you have to clamp the perforators to different perforators. And um, so those are the key things. It's it's something, a good tool to, to be familiar with. Yeah. Okay, thank you, bro. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dewi. A last question from Dr. Gina. She is a plastic surgeon from Semarang, Karedi Hospital. This is Dr. Gina. Thank you, uh, Prof. John. I'm Gina from Karedi Hospital. Uh, I would like to, to ask you, in Karedi Hospital, uh, so many patients came with uh, advanced uh, cancer, and when the oncology remove the mass or the breast, it will uh, leave a large skin defect. And in here, sometimes we just uh, close uh, the defect with skin graft. How uh, how is your opinion about that? And uh, how your suggestion to the next reconstruction of these cases with a large defect and uh, immediately what we should do or if uh, we uh, had uh, covered with skin, uh, skin graft, what next uh, we do for the breast reconstruction? Thank you, Prof. That's a good question. So those kind of uh, cases with advanced breast cancer missing uh, skin already, 
if you're missing a lot of skin defect, then you have to uh, do reconstruction with pro providing a uh, missing skin. So definitely you need to you need to have autologous reconstructions. Implant-based reconstruction in that kind of situation is not going to be helpful. So you have to use a tissue from the abdomen or to tissue from the back uh, with latissimus. And the back, usually you have a, about a palm size of back tissue that you can utilize to supplement the missing skin. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Uh, uh, let me conclude, say the conclusion of this lecture, this morning lecture. So the successful breast reconstruction, especially in the breast cancer patient, we have to collaborate between uh, other specialty. So we have a ideal breast cancer teamwork. So we can have restoration of both aesthetic, improving patient outcome and quality of life. Okay. Yeah. The other thing that I forgot to mention is patient awareness. And go to TV, go to magazines, to go to newspapers. Tell what a plastic surgeon uh, can can offer for the patients, because a lot of patients do not know what it is. Uh, people do not understand what is the value of having reconstructions. What is the capacity or capability of the plastic surgeon that can help these patients? Okay, thank yeah. you very much for the lecture and the uh, knowledge that you sharing this morning. Uh, I please the MC for the close the lecture. Uh, give applause for the professor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Pujitriani, for moderating this session. And thank you, Professor Rizal Johan, MD, MBA, for the lecture. The experience that you share with us today helped us learn so much specifically about breast reconstruction. And it was a great pleasure to have you as a visiting professor by online. We also thank the Department of General Surgery Residency Program for arranging this lecture. Before we end this session, let us take a picture together. Uh, for participant who who participate this online, you can turn on your camera so we can show this the screenshot. Ini belum, ini belum. Okay, for the first page. One, two, smile. Okay, for the next page. One, two, three, smile. Okay, for the last page. One, two, three, smile. Okay, that's all. Thank you for the online participant who is actually- Thank you, Dr. Puji. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Puji. Thank you, Prof. Rizal Johan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Rizal. Uh, bye. Okay, bye bye. See you in, in Manado. You. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Terima kasih, Dr. Ocha. Terima kasih, Dr. Rani. Terima kasih, Dr. Irena. Dr. Fauzi, terima kasih, Dr. Eri. Terima kasih, Dok. Terima kasih, Puji. Terima kasih, Gina. Terima kasih, Puji. Terima kasih, Puji. Ya, Dr. Izin kami tutup, ya, dokter. Terima kasih, dokter.